Wow. Waiting for the signal from the back. That's one token. That is one token. Jay, can you check if it said there's a red button on there? See what it says? I already started it. Okay. It says top stop broadcasting. Nope. Keep going. You're all set. Show us the Cameras, cameras, camera. Camera. Two in the ceiling. In my lapel. <laughs> in my, in my shoe yeah. I'm just waiting for the go. So. Please bear with me. <laughs> no, we need them. <laughs> yeah, we should put the lock down. Yeah. Right. Take our feet. That's the one he approved. Exact same. Well, I guess we could start with who knows what this is. I do. Yeah, yeah. Is that a floppy disk? Well, not so floppy. What's on the big side of it? It is. Uh, don't break this rhythm. And back when, you know, it has Peter Gabriel, produced by Daniel Lanois and Peter Gabriel, engineered by Kevin Killen. Credits. Credits on the, <laughs> on the media itself. Could you live and die for your credits? We good? All right. Well, welcome, everybody, to Play With Your Music. Uh, this is our first set of live interviews, and we're pleased to have with us Kevin Killen. Engineer, producer, mixer, and Jerry Murata. Uh, and I'm Alex Ruthman, uh, Associate Professor of Music Education and Music Technology here at the NYU Steinart School. And I'm pleased also to have my colleague Alex Case from UMass Law. So today we're thrilled to start off our live interview series uh, with Kevin and with Jerry to talk a little bit about uh, their involvement and the creative processes and, and thinking behind uh, Peter Gabriel's legendary So album, in particular uh, the track Sledgehammer and In Your Eyes, which uh, Peter has graciously uh, provided us access to for our Play With Your Music course. And uh, if you're watching this video and uh, have not participated in the course, you're finding it through other means, you can come and join the community and uh, start interacting with everybody at Play With Your Music. So, to get started, uh, I'd like to start with Kevin. And uh, one of the things when in doing research and uh, reading other articles that you've, uh, that you've contributed to and videos is uh, I started getting curious about your musical background before uh, you got to you know, your, your, your stage of becoming an engineer. We, we hear a lot of 
you, I think you were, you were you were studying the sciences at Trinity That's correct. College, yeah. and uh, had an interest in music, and then fell into uh, in a, a recording studio and apprenticing through that. But what was your musical background before apprenticing in college, and what led you then? You know, could you could you trace that development there uh, to your sure. work with self? And um, well, I was I'm, I'm one of eight kids. Um, my parents uh, raised us in Dublin, Ireland, and all my uh, siblings who five of them were older than me, all interested in music, so I grew up surrounded by music. Um, and as a teenager, I started to play guitar. Uh, and then I really got interested in drums. So I was really just playing drums with friends, and I had no real aspiration to be a musician. But I sort of loved the instruments. And uh, so I bought myself a drum set, a premier drum set, Royal Blue. And uh, my parents at that point wanted me to leave the house. And uh, and so I was going through the equivalent of high school here, or secondary school in Ireland. Um, I tried to figure out what I wanted to do for my college course, and I was actually interested in becoming a mechanical engineer. And so through that college process, the first year I missed out getting into a course in mechanical engineering training by one point of the phone system. So I decided I'd go back and repeat the course the following year, and then the next year I had the same number of points. Actually, I, I increased my points to by one point. So I would thought that, except they had also increased the number of points. So then I got bumped into my second choice, which was the sciences. And, I'm, and I was very keen on science. So I went into Trinity College, and I was in the class with about 300 students. And we had pre med students, science students, and uh, uh, pharmacy students all in the, in the first year of freshman class. And the dean of the faculty, maybe in the first week or so, and so he didn't really care whether we showed up for class, he didn't really care whether we participated, whether we was concerned about this our year end. And that really turned me off to the notion of spending the next four years in Trinity, even though it was a wonderful faculty and a great community. But I started thinking, well, is this something I'm going to do for the rest of my life? So I got through my first year, enjoyed it, you know, to a certain degree, did okay in my examinations. And then in my second year, I really started to question whether this is something. <laughs> and I was still playing, and I was taking drumming lessons from my teacher. And uh, when it got around to February, my second year, I started thinking, what am I going to do for the summer? I need to protect some money for education. And so I started looking around at various opportunities, and I'd seen a documentary on the making of police records. That was like a really fascinating thing. How do they actually make records? So I looked. Let me pull up the yellow pages and uh, looked up recording studios in Dublin and I went and went every recording studio in Dublin. And fortunately enough, there was a studio that was sitting at home. Just as an intern, really good summer, it And then are there particular uh, uh, things that you learned from your prior musical experiences that you still draw on today uh, as a producer, an engineer, a mixer, and various projects? So the very first studio I worked at was a, it was set up, and so there were three principal owners. One of the owners was a jingle writer. So every morning, Monday through Friday, uh, studio time was set aside for writing jingles, recording jingles, so 9 a.m. to 1 o'clock with the jingle slides. And then typically there was an hour switch over, 2 to 11 o'clock. It's a traditional problem, problem sort of receiving problems. And then from what we call the graveyard shift, it was open to the staff to find young artists to come in. And so we, so the thing that was really formative for me was the jingle exposure because in a typical four-hour session, you would have to go in, set up the studio, record a full rhythm section, uh, do vocal overdubs, do musical overdubs, mix, edit, you know, between a 30-second, 60-second, and a 90-second spot, and give all those copies. I mean, take, take copies, so quarter inches and half inch, take copies, plus cassettes, all documented and handed to the client within a four-hour period. So that discipline of having, um, uh, I, I guess, just the, the forward to, to figure out how you want to impose your system on, on the session to exact the exact uh, to exact the maximum amount of time. And that's standing me through the year. It's just a good preferred you know, session, making sure everything is buttoned down from the piece of music. So it was not uncommon to be in the studio at 7 a.m. or 9 a.m. So I made sure that all the papers were set, all the microphones were set, everything was preset. 
as soon as the musicians came in within 10 minutes, you'd already got a balance. And, you know, so that, I can still work very fast in that environment and getting sounds. And uh, I try not to let the process go away. What were we balancing back then? I mean, what were we working What was the recording platform? Uh, so the recording platform was a. It, it wasn't virtual. So it wasn't. No. No, it was, it was a Studer uh, 16 track, uh -huh. A80, and then really? we had a Helios console that was 32 in. Good. And uh, it was pretty much it. It was, a, it was a long rectangular room. It was just one control room, just a one room facility. It was like kind of an East Lake design, you know, live end, dead end, in the array. And um, it was a pretty tight sounding room, but it was really, you know, it was, it was pretty nice. We had a look at the drum booth that was probably the size of that corner. And the drum booth was squeezed his drum set in there, trying to work but you had to mix. You had to. Everything had to be recorded. You only had sixteen tracks. You only had sixteen tracks. So drums were typically on four. So it's kit, uh, which had kit, which had like toms mixed into it, and high hat, and then kit and snare. Yeah. And then one track for bass, two tracks for acoustic guitar, two tracks for piano, one for you know maybe some organ or you know, whatever the keyboard was going on. <laughs> and then you know a couple of spare tracks and no automation. We had no automation. So everything was just mixed by. So typically mixing would be you've done your basic tracks, you've done your vocal and you've the background parts, and you just take a little piece of white sticky tape and you put them on the table and then you make your move and you make your marks for representing moves. And then a couple of would grab behind the console and just move the things and there was a performance. Right. So but you, you it took more than took, oftentimes took more than one thing. Yeah, it was so they had you people. got you there. Yeah. You were like you were there like, okay, when this part comes, pull that down yeah, here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Push yeah, yeah. People like at the console all moving the tables. That's right. Yeah, usually the usually the writer and the if the writer was and the producer were the same person. They would probably do the vocal portion, and I would often be doing the vocal section. And so yeah, I'd be doing drums and bass, and they'd be doing the vocal. So a multi-person performance. Multi-person performance. Okay. Yeah. And you, you sometimes you make mistakes. You go stop in the recording. So the recorder would turn that way. So stop. So okay, let's just roll back five seconds and pick it up, and then you finish off the piece, and then you deliver the you know, Splice it together. But I mean, these were short tingles. I mean, the longest thing we ever did was a two minute piece. Oh, yeah, sure. So you would record a two minute piece, and then you would edit that down to a 60 second component, or 45 second component, or whatever the derivation of that was. You would edit. So you would do a fade up on the moment for the edit. It was all. Great way to learn. It was a great way you to learn. You had to do it fast. You had to do it fast. And they, the, the, they weren't, nobody was probably real worried about. It wasn't like working at a Peter Gabriel record where no. it's hyper examining every aspect of no. what you're doing. They just get the job done. And you had like a great core group of session players whose job was like they were they knew they were coming in for an hour. They were going to execute on the tasks they had in front of And then they were going to go off to another session and another student and do the same thing. And they need to come back to you for the afternoon session. And in the evening sessions that would be the graveyard shift because this was like 79, 1980, 1981. Um, the whole punk new wave explosion was occurring in the UK, and so everybody who was in the band of Dublin wanted to get signed to a record deal. And that typically at the time was you know, a couple hundred thousand pounds, maybe like three or four thousand dollars you know, to, to be right around. So everybody wanted to go in and make it down. And so the studio was like, well, we're not going to put our chief engineer on there, but you can work with somebody young. And, and for a flat fee of a couple hundred pounds, we can the studio tape. And an engineer and the system. So we can make whatever mistakes we could. And the great thing about the system at the studio I worked which was called Lombard Sound, was that the chief engineer, his name was Philip Bagley, he was very willing to listen to your work that you did on the great project. And so I remember him playing in my very first like, demo that I was in. Friends, in fact, a group of friends that I played with. And it was the worst recording. <laughs> I, well, I actually found it inside of it there a couple of years ago later. And it was <laughs> but he was really, he was really magnanimous, and he said, "Well, it's, it's a good start. And this is where, this is where you need to, you know." Like I had all the game stage in the world, and the balance is really good. Really but, but he was gracious enough to say, "Look, why don't you, why don't you put the most time here where you can make this and make it better?" And so you learned literally on the fly. Sure. There, there was no course. I think it was a Tone Meister course at college in Surrey. And that was it. I mean, there, were, there weren't that many manuals. There. So, literally, the only manuals you would read were the tech manuals. So, it was a question of being engaged. And because I was, you know, 
technically interesting and curious. I was I was always willing to kind of take up the moment, but I don't understand what they're certainly doing. Your education is right there. That was my branding. Well, let's fast forward to Ashton House when you worked with Peter Gabriel on So. The participants in this online community might find it reassuring to know that this wasn't a typical commercial recording studio. It was actually a home studio. <laughs> yeah. At a very high level. So I wonder if you could sort of paint a picture of what you saw when you walked into uh, the place for the first time in terms of who's where and what's where. I imagine there were serious acoustic treatments, that sort of thing, just so that our participants can sort of see that maybe their home studio working environments are able to achieve our production standards. So the original, so Ashton House was, uh, was Peter's working studio for kind of Birdie soundtrack and so, and it was located uh, in an old compass. It was about seven miles at South Bath in the western part of the UK. And when I got there, it was basically a long rectangular building. Which it was a cowboy. It was a cowboy. It really, it had, in its previous iteration, it had never been cash yet, so it was a brick structure about a foot and a half. And it had a, I think it had a metal roof. I, I don't know. How I think it had a metal roof that had some kind of fusion involved. <clears throat> there I walked in, so the first uh, third of the uh, of that building was the control. You had to walk up the steps to get there. So uh, I don't know if it had been raised. So you would be putting a screen there, or that was from the original footprint of the building. And when you walked in, there was uh, an SSL, a 4000 E series, straight in front of you. And then to the right were the two tape machines, the two studio. One was a. Uh, Library? No, there was a Studio A80. And uh -huh. then you had that modified studio that Colin brought, the local kind of audio expert had modified. Sure. But he had a transport in the chassis, and all the audio parts were something he and then there was some behind the back wall were all people's keyboards, the Paralyte and Prop and the CP70, and there was an emulator, and there was a you know, few other things like Boombox, and then Polymoon. Yeah, Polymoon. And then then we had a couple of microphone stands for various things. And then that was pretty much it was pretty rudimentary. There was a Rebox E77 up there. And there was a That was his kind of at that point, that was probably his way of Recording an idea. Yeah, it was recording. It was like, the, the, it was yeah. like having a little cassette deck. Yeah. Now, now the adapt machine. Yeah. Yeah. Not a, no, I'm sorry. Not even a so, it's a yeah. 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 so but it was quite rudimentary. Um, and then, so the main entrance into the building, there was, when you walk straight ahead, there was a like a little tech station. To the right was the recording space. So there was no visual contact between the control and the space. And the recording space, had a lot of concrete, a couple of windows, and there was also a window in the control. So you could see the daylight, you could talk to some people about it. Or cast outside. Yeah, but <laughs> I, I'm sorry, but you know, I was in that building long before the studio. Because he had rented that house for us to, re to stay in, and we rehearsed in that room. For, for a few years, we were rehearsing in that room. And uh, pre so, we recorded in but they brought in a truck. Right. It was like the Rolling Stones truck. And as often happened back then, it was a country lane. And I remember the truck came in from the wrong direction. It couldn't make the turn. Couldn't make the turn up to the so everything Peter tried to do back then, if it was supposed to take two hours, it could take like five days to figure out how to get the truck. They couldn't get it out, you know, it was unbelievable. But so we initially we recorded, uh, we started recording in there before anything was done with it, any kind of treatment. With, with, with they eventually did get that recording truck in in the driveway, and uh, we started recording in that very same way. Right. But it was never meant. <clears throat> yeah, it was. Yeah, it wasn't. It wasn't, it wasn't really conceived as a studio. Kind of evolved. I remember when he put the window, mm -hmm. the cows would come out of the field down, and they would they would <laughs> walk by the window. And one day we came to the studio, and there was this haze all over the studio. The cows were licking; they they were licking the window uh, from the outside as they were walking by. They they just started licking the window. So it was this beautiful view. We went in one day. We got in, and you couldn't hardly see anything. The cow saliva, because the cows were walking by and licking the window. 
Classic key. It was Dusk Beetle. It could be, uh, the, the actual recording space was, took up the other two thirds of the building. It's not the building. It was, again, it was an electric treatment with like concrete. And we had several PA, and we uh, just kind of glanced at the OS when he was working on the keyboard. So we had a, a, a duplicate setup in the building. It seems to have a drum machine. Just a way to get ideas down here for you so that you can then come in. That was the basis. So it really wasn't purposely designed to do that. But it was remarkable what they had. And and without going down the rabbit hole of which mics were where, can you speak generally to how such great sounds came out of that space and not really intended to? Is it it all in the hands of the performer and the in their instruments, or their, is there a question to be giving people? I do think it does count. Yeah, I do think it comes down to performing. A lot of it comes from the musicians that were hired to play the room. My job, and I always feel myself when I'm just hired as an engineer, is to, in one aspect of the room, just to be the documentarian, to capture what's going on in the room. And then, if appropriate, then to take that and maybe expand upon it and, and, and create something from that that would inspire and further you know, process. I think a lot of it, it was, we had a very basic setup and we were, you know, that console, we used all the mic we the console, we used all the EQ on the console, everything was processed through that console, which, you know, of course, makes me your best assistances to be able to improve the console. Um, there's a lot to be hired on. So in the UK, the power of the 220, we're the power of the power of the power of the power it gives a different sound to the So I never felt like a thin sound in the console. So I do think it's time for players. Well, it's interesting, if you don't mind. Um, it's not about self, but the security record, which was the record before. Um, David Lord was the producer, engineer, and he was a local guy that did that. I remember, you know, for about a year and a half after that record came out, every studio I went into, not only did they have the record in the controller, but they got some, they got the Kevin, the version of Kevin when he was summer interning at his studio to ask me if I would stay after the session. They wanted to talk about the record, because it was kind of a, in a different way, it was a groundbreaking record song. And it's so funny, because talking to David Ward, I remember running into David Ward, who recorded it and mixed it, and, and, and um, he said, Jerry, I can't believe anybody thinks that record sounds good. Mm -hmm. Because they did things that you were never supposed to do. It was all on or on tape. So bouncing drums from track, you know, back and forth. How many times can you do it? How many times can you bounce from one analog to another analog machine? And you're not supposed to do that at all. But they, you know, they were just Peter was Peter. You know, he had he had to just you know do just constantly wanted to try new things. Including getting to a point where they were bouncing stuff, and the oxide on the tape was—it was like if you didn't get this bounce right, the the, the, the yeah, scratch, yeah, scratch, yeah. Yeah, it was it. It was it. If it didn't go down properly, so I mean, I think that says a lot about what. First of all, especially with Peter creatively, he sets the table for people to, to do things that that they're you know. Go beyond their, you know, their not their ability, but just their sensibility. Um, just doing, you know, continuing to trying to, you know, he had it in his head, but he never really articulated because it, it was like it wasn't something you could write out and somebody was like, it was like sound, you know, it was a like a sound and atmosphere, and you know, and you know, we I I was involved. Not so much on so, but on the other the records prior to that, that process with him, you know, over time, just working out how to get the music to sound right, and then hopefully have it be recorded well. But I think, as I said, with David Ward and the security, the security record, you know, they do whatever they had to do, you know what I mean, to be able to make it be what it, he wanted it to be, regardless of whether it was like. Um, Technologically. Technologically, the right thing to do. So I think it's, can, it's there's a little bit of both, but in the oftentimes, I think the records that have that kind of soulfulness are more successful than 
that could sound not sound so great have, are, are more <laughs> successful than records that are, sound really great, but the creative side of it is kind of like I think that they're, they're 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 you're better off to some degree. You know, if you can get them both working for you, that's great. But but creatively, I think those those older records really prove that that was. Me. And I think with Peter's with so, you know, in the end when I listen to the, the record, it's just, it's phenomenally recorded, but the the playing, the the, the creative creativity on it, on it, it's just. So it's sort of an unfair or even impossible question, but uh, our online participants participants might wish they could have been a fly on the wall for some of those sessions where both of you are asked to be a creative extension of you know, those that you're describing. Like, there's this really motivating force for the whole project. But can you describe how that works, what, how you find your way to a drum part that's in his head and he's describing it as a texture or an atmosphere? And, you convert that into a performance or anything. Is there any way to sort of tell one of those stories? Well, I, I, I think for me, first of all, we were very compatible. He really liked my the way I played. Um, he he liked my drumming a lot. So just to start with, we were in a good place. Uh, and then, you know, we just we'd experiment as much as we could, and you know. Early on, it was you know maybe a 24 track. But they weren't even you couldn't even sync two machines. Mm -hmm. So you know we had our hands full trying to create this stuff and get it all into 24 tracks. But um, and then of course the, the, it didn't hurt to have you know, Tony Levin was the bass player you know throughout my time with Peter, which was about 10 years. Um, just Larry Fast, it just was a phenomenal group of people that, excuse me, he, we just worked so well together. Peter had so much trust and respect for what we were doing. And, and uh, of course, we did for him as well. But, it, you know, it just seemed to work. It was never, it was, there was never a situation where there was any real frustration or anger over something that with anybody any one of us did, um, but we would just try, sometimes we would just try something and then we'd come back and do it again, try it differently. But um, yeah, it, it, it was we developed a real bond as a as a band. So you really were an ensemble assembled in the studio. But you were you really were a band. Yeah, we, I mean we had worked together on uh, for many years. Tony and Larry were with Peter on his first record. Um, the Salisbury Hill record. I, I, I started playing with him just after that. Um, so but we, we worked together for about 10 years. And uh, yeah, we developed a, a tremendous, um, tremendous rapport. It's interesting because I remember recording um, a song that he didn't have finished. He didn't have a title for it. But it was, um, I think it ended up being Big Time. But we did our version of Big Time, like that. It was like security, the next generation. And it was, I had goosebumps for like a day. So deep. Really deep. And we were so good at not getting that. You know, we, we did we so many years of doing it together. It didn't take us that long to get to that place. You know what I mean? Because we just had developed a, a working relationship with him. And it was. You know, it was fierce, fierce. I, I, it's funny. I wonder if there's a perversion of it somewhere. I was, I was wonder about that because it's nothing like the one that's on the record. It certainly wouldn't have been. I don't think it would have been a big hit because it was, it was that Peter. <laughs> it was Peter Preso, Preso, Preso Peter. And uh, but, but yeah, it was incredible, incredible. We did a few, a few tracks like that uh, that ended up being. Different, um, ultimately on the record. No, Peter, I'm sure he's, there's an archive of some of this. We've never discovered any musical so it's, it's there somewhere. Yeah. Whether he can put his finger on it, I'm not sure, but it definitely it exists. It might just be on the set, but it exists. <laughs> <laughs> but it may be. But I, we were always recording, we were always in a, in a, in a mode, we were always recording every idea, trying to make sure that whenever it was in, 
throwing in a little bit of the control room of the boot space that was getting documented because you never knew when that particular idea might yield like a great tour to the song for him lyrically or to take the song in a different direction. And those moments did occur in the And so, you know, a lot of times it was happenstance and sometimes it was it was because we were exploring the songs. But yeah, we, you know, with Peter, you know, he, he always surrounded himself with great musicians like Jerry and Tony and, and David Rhodes and Diary. And so, and sometimes after the tracking dates when a musician was available, he would have them come down to the studio and he would have them play new ideas on the existing tracks. Sometimes that would then spawn a whole new one. So you were constantly like going around. It wasn't like a typical record where you go in and say, well, the first couple of weeks you just record the basic tracks and hear the basic tracks and you're not going to change that much. Constantly churning and reinventing themselves, and just you know, because the creative process was such that Peter was looking for these trigger points for lyrical ideas, and because his approach to lyrical ideas were you know, he had to invest himself in the track and really you know, draw these lyrics out of himself. And he's very particular about what he wants to say and say, and that process took a really long time. He still had to keep the churn going. Not that it was a lot of fun to do that, but it's still. Quite a lot of management in terms of tape and resources. And a, a very typical Gabriel story. It would be, I could be out tuning it, just <laughs> like it, and he'll run and go, I love that. <laughs> I love that. Like, he'll find something. You know, and he'll have it in his head. You know, all of those archive things, he'll have it get this tape, get this. This thing you're working on, do that, you yeah, know, yeah. like randomly banging on something, you know, and turning it drunk. You, you know what I mean? He, he's the king of that. He, it, it, you know, the more you try to do something, you know, like sort of in a standard way, um, the, the less he liked it, you know, which is ironic, and you know, and probably a whole nother um, gathering. About the fact that really so was the one time that he didn't do that. I mean, where it ended up being a lot more mainstream, ultimately like big time sledgehammer. Like they're much more sort of stock arrangements. You know what I, you know what I mean? They they were more straightforward and very much geared towards a certain kind of music, like the, you know R and B. Uh, but the, the you know some of this earlier stuff, he was always trying to just push the envelope. And, and find ways to make things sound like they they weren't supposed to sound. He, he would do that a lot, and we had a lot of fun. So breakthroughs would happen like sometimes you'd be kind of working, trying something, trying something, and then you get away from it, and then some, you know, something would happen, and bam, it would just come together like in a short period of time. You know that somehow it just all it all gelled. It's interesting. But he was very good at knowing when that moment. I think that's one of the things he does best. He does a lot of things really well. Knowing how to make that moment happen or recognizing, even in the tuning of the drum. It's like, that's what I want. I want it to I don't want it to sound like a guy playing music. I want it to sound like this a guy's out in the back and he's hammering something, you know. Not particularly in time. He's so good at at, at recognizing when those things are are brilliant. That's great. Yeah. Uh, I, I wonder if you could speak a little bit to the sort of discipline and work ethic associated with this album. It's pretty famous for long days and long production time. And one might just listen to the recordings and think, well, it sounds like some monster players were just jamming and all you had to do was get it on tape and done. But I think behind that was a not quite an eight to five job, but a 20 hour day. Just sort of describe the routine. How did you guys know when to show up, know when to stop? Well, I got, I got called off the record. Um, Dan Lenoir and I had worked a prior year in Dublin with a YouTube project called Fire. And I moved to New York right after it. And so Dan and I were still in communication, and, and uh, I visited his studio from Hamilton, uh, just outside Toronto, and just like uh, previous. Uh, New year. Anyway, um, Dan called me and asked me if I'd be interested in coming up and mix the 
So my brief was that I was going to the UK for six, six weeks, two weeks. <laughs> and I flew from New York to Heathrow at the end of the June in 1985. And it's a th at that time, it was a three hour drive from Heathrow down to the studios in here. And so I was driving down with the assistant, this gentleman named Dave Stolman, and we're just chit chatting as we go through the time. He said, So, how long did they ask you to stay? And I said, You know, maybe six weeks, two months. You're going to be here for 10 months. And I was like, <laughs> I know Peter, and I, and I know where the record is right now. So I was really perplexed, and I said, I don't really understand. I said, you, you'll understand when you get there. So I got there, and Dan had alluded to it a little bit. So when they had done the initial tracking with Dan, and uh, David Baskin, who was a two surprise engineer, had initially done with the band, uh, they had played over Peter's original demos. Peter had two tape machines, two Studer AAs. One was the like a stock A80, and then there was the model. And the day before the tracking occurred, they installed an Adam Smith synchronizer. And that synchronizer assumed that both machines were operating, you know, on the same level. That the synchronized card was the same. It was an FM card, it was a DC card. But they were supposed to be the you know, synchronizer was set up to send pulses to two FM cards. So you had that was one issue. Then you had the issue of Peter had his demos originally on um, it was like a two-track lintron pattern, probably a profit pad, maybe a some percussion. And they were the basic demos that he played to the band. And we were in the studio space and they were playing that. So he demoed on the B reel and then they were going to the edition, which is a standard A. And so when they get through that first reel, they'd say, oh, but they A take up on the B machine and that's this is what performs and they record a fresh piece of tape on the A machine. So they kept doing that until they got more tape. What was occurring was that the two machines were drifting. In the of the drift. And then on top of that, because the A80 had a capstone motor which literally pinched the tape and literally pulled it through from one side from the supply reel to the taker. Um, first three minutes of the tension of the reel and the last three minutes of the tension of the reel weren't uniform, so they kept on a little bit of ball. So afterwards, they discovered which they should bring that, you know, take one and take six, and then put them on the two machines and hit play, and start and see them start getting it. And the drift would get wider and wider. And that doesn't seem good. <laughs> no, it's not good, it's not, and it's not what they intended, and they didn't even realize that that was. So part of my brief was to come in and help with um, Keeping the day-to-day -day flow of the project, you know, which Dan had a really good, Dan had a really good overview of, to keep that going, and then also to try and come up with a system where we could then somehow resynchronize tape, you know, you know, the master tape with the slave and and that took the process. And that's what David was alluding to when we got in the back. Plus, he also knew that Peter hadn't really written it. It was only a certain way forward in writing. So. Um, it was going to take a fair amount of time for those two to play. And so that was that was probably not, that's so our day was broken up into he would arrive at the studio pretty early in the day, maybe around nine thirty in the morning time to pick up two girls out to school. And then we would work to lunch and we'd wait for like half an hour and then come back in and work you know, from like two in the afternoon until seven and have a break and then Dan and I would work on some other ideas. Maybe some bands videos or maybe some heavy. And then down the bed and then I would stay up and then I had a long list of, of things that I needed to go through to get my clients and my clients to work. And that was, you know, it was 25. So I had nothing but time. We were in the middle of the countryside. So it was seven miles from civilization. And I didn't, you know, I wasn't driving. So I didn't care. I just stayed. Ten months later, you left and you were 30. Yeah, ten months later, you were 30. And I had a beard. I had a fresh, fresh face and I came out with a beard. I went with one little small bag and I left it too. It was that was one of the things about working out in the country. There's, you know, it was like being, in, you know, it was like a survival. Yeah. It really was being out in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. Just. But it was a great experience, and you know, Peter was incredibly gracious at the time, and he, he would surround himself with great people. So you didn't mind putting in the wrong arrows, and you know, I, you know, I've been in huge chances as well. So. Is this? But there were challenges for sure. And, and one of the things you have to remember with that I'm sure 
that you remember this. You know, you're always battling. So you know, when you set for tracking, you set the microphones, you have to position in the room, and you're listening to what we would call input. You're listening live to the feed from the microphones to the console, and you're hearing a great sound. And then you would flip over to take return, and you would hear what's going back on. And it was never quite the same. People love the way analog sound. And I was always frustrated because what I wanted to record was what I was, what was on the input side. What I was getting back was a close approximation, but it wasn't what I really wanted to hear. It was maybe a little squidgy sounding, or maybe the top end seemed like not quite improved as I thought it was. And the bass was maybe a little fatter or a little, a little more diffuse than what was coming in the console. So, so you have that on the first one of the playback. And then every other playback is what you do issue that you're literally physically pulling this tape across the hands, physically pushing the tape across this caster. You're getting the physical properties from the upside falling off the tape, so you get the shedding. So you're constantly battling, having your head, first day you record versus what you now have, which is always slightly changing. So to me, it was always frustrating that you had this great sound source, and you could never really get back to that source. So we were always trying to devise methods to and make it more brilliant, compensate for the fact that it's going to lose you know, things and response over time. And for projects like Peter's, where it lasts such a long time, um, that was really concerning. And you were, so you would actively do that sort of EQ things differently to anticipate generation loss? A little bit, yeah. We maybe tended to record a little bit more on the brighter side, and assume that over time it was it just slowly more mellow. And, uh, but we were also, when we were recording, uh, you know, it was definitely a, an approach that Dan loved, and Peter loved too. Was that instead of instead of just having one player come up with a part, they would actually come together with three or four different instruments, combine those instruments together into a team, and with treatments so with effects and with processing. So then, when you pushed up those faders, it wasn't wasn't necessarily an obvious that this is just a piano, this is just a guitar part. It's like some other combination, and we did that part. Partially because we wanted to, after the performance was recorded, we always wanted to have that sound on tape, documented exactly as it was. Because you play differently when you play performance as opposed to when you're hearing them on the monitors. Uh, and also because you wanted to impose a certain structure on your so, yeah. Well, as you know, for this online community, Peter Gabriel has made available the track stems for in your eyes. Um, and Sledgehammer, uh, and I wonder if there's an example that you think that students might later find, either in the next recording or in these stems that might be a good example of all those sort of, sort of printed Comps and stands. Yeah, is there anything that comes to mind that might be obvious enough that students can study later? I think in the chorus part of In Your Eyes, that, 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 that part of the arpeggiating the, the, the guitar part is actually a combination of guitar, piano, and should we maybe try to listen to a bit of it? Sure. Should we pull up the pads as well? Yeah. I don't really know how the pads are configured, so we might just be here. Take a listen. <laughs> Actually, the song was probably already 7% done. Well, 7 
would have changed, not from the drum perspective, but certainly you know, the monitoring would have changed. That's, that sounds like Peter. And that would be Peter. And, and that part, the part that was the course, I think, was originally that for Peter. So then, not only are you dealing with the fact that all of a sudden we're going to have to you know, mute all these parts, find tracks for the new parts, and now we're going to have to actually physically you know, change the structure. So that's you know, the thing that you know, cutting across you know, two inch tape, which is fine to add a two inch tape, but when you have a master reel and six slave reels and five slave reels all tied together for synchronization, you realize that as soon as you put the edit across the two inch tape, the synchronization is, is uh, really useless. So, uh, Opposed to an interesting series of technical obstacles that we're doing. So, yes, so the things like that would occur. You're starting to say that this arpeggiating the high guitar part isn't just guitar? It's, it's, so it's, two, it's, it's two, it should be two guitar parts together. I always thought there was a piano part in there, but so we we'll see it. It's, it's right. That was a failure. That was a failure. Um, Originally in stereo. That, in stereo, but all of that. Yeah. That was all, all blended, blended down together. Yeah, jazz. with with effects. Great. I mean, that's so. I mean, a classic. Peter tried not to get it to sound like what it is. In a way. Right. You know, to, to create sounds. Like, like for instance, you know, when I was working with him, I remember um, it was like very early on with synthesizers. Very. And, uh, and I remember Larry coming in with a with a Prophet Five. He had a Prophet Five delivered to Ashton to the studio, and I, I I just watched him take it out of the box. He didn't even plug it in. He just got a screwdriver out. He opened it up. He went right in, looked through it, started looking at stuff, and then he kind of dove in and he did a few things to it. I don't know what that was. And closed it up and you know. Doing it? What the hell were you doing? You didn't even plug it in to see what it's doing. He's like, no, I, I, I knew I had to go in and look and see. And then there were a couple of things he said I, I kind of wanted to change a few little things that that they had done with it. So. But we never used Peter would never use a patch, like you know, ne never and use like a pre a patch on us as they get, got more developed. You know, you could, you know, you get synthesizers with pre set patches. Nowadays, you can, there's thousands of them. But he, you know, the last thing in the world he would ever do is use anything that, was, that, that, that you would find on a keyboard that anybody else could use. He's, that's one of the things that made the, his record sound so unusual. Whatever, well, like that sound, you can't find that sound. That sound that you blended together with the guitar, the piano, you know, leaking in the background, and whatever other sounds. You, that's unique to that record. Mm -hmm. No one else in the world has access to that sound. Yeah, I'm sure if you if you listen to snare drums over time, with Peter, they never sound like a snare drum when they keep changing. He's always trying to make things not sound like classic motivator. Yeah, it's a 
And we always had a setup, but the console was always set up where we had, it wasn't very big console, it was 56 inputs, so we had maybe eight dedicated channels for the effects for terms of the 16 you know, and so. And we would often have, so we have like a reverb, a couple of reverbs, so there was an ORMX 16 MS, there was a Quantic Room Simulator, we had a plate, an EMT plate, we had the, the Rebox tape snap, and we had an AMS delay, um, Delta Lab um, delay, and then there was, there was a couple of other like forcing effects. And then the idea was, and this is how like, in the way the down likes to work, you could say, okay, here's the, here's the sound, and we would cascade effects into one another. So literally, as you're playing, you start to hear this effects be generated and then generate back on themselves, and so create a whole illusion from the digital source. Effects. And, and rather than leave that to chance to have to recreate a later point every time you came back to the sound, we just like, well, we love the way that sounds. Let's just kind of you know, work punch that sound into the edition of the sound. So it wasn't, you know, it was inspired by the guitar, but it was really, it became an evolving sound. Okay. And, and how does that collaborative process work for you? It seems like you're part of the ensemble too, and that Peter must have been giving you some guidance for what to do with those who circulate delays with reverb? Or did you just sort of become simpatico with the band also and you sort of knew the right directions to explore, just as Jerry and the right from Yeah, he, he, you know, from the very first day he just encouraged, you know, he encouraged your participation. It felt like you were a kindred spirit he wanted you to, to, you know, branch out. And even then making a mistake and doing something that wasn't, um, and Peter loves the happy accident. He, he, he loves to walk into a room and suddenly hear something he's never heard before. That Turn the loop to it, take them up all the time. We actually had one of those. With many instances of that, but the one that sticks in, uh, most strong in my mind is um, so on the original version of Mercy Street, it actually was actually pitched high and ended on the to the And after we've gone through the whole period of the summer where we finally figured out a way of retrieving all those lost performances from slavery as back onto the master, we had. Uh, Compiled a new master, a digital master, on the 32 track And I was running, in conjunction with that, I was running a separate, separate news um, for, for trainers. And one day I was doing something on the Mitsubishi where the very speed was engaged, but it was engaged, so the machine was running at its slow speed. It was like 10% below. And we were having a conversation, and then whatever I was doing, it rolled with the next song, the next song was. Mercy Street at the time was called for row. And, uh, and because it was running at a lower pitch, everybody's head just turned and was like, what, what is that sound? Because suddenly those triangles have a much higher pitch, suddenly more grainy, and you know, had a different timbre to it. And that then became like an inspiration for like, the their vocal idea. And so it was just confusing how that particular thing again, if you actually I think on the 12 inch portion of the section, which is released on that, the original pitch of the section was released on the pitch. You know, in my experience with him, technologically, he, he really didn't, he wasn't that immersed in technology, in like, okay, run it through the delay, and then this, and then that, you know, he, he, he just, like you said, he wanted you to do something. If, if you had, if you were, if you fit them, you know, fit in. And he liked you, and he thought you were creative. It's like do something. You know, just you know, play around with it. But he wasn't. He wasn't really. I never found him deeply immersed in himself, knowing what all the technology does. And you know, he he, he was too busy, you know, being creative and thinking in a different way, and and learning about how. EQ works and delays work and reverb. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Mm -hmm. I mean I, he, it's good. It was a good thing. He didn't get too bogged down in, in, technology. in the technology. But he let you get bogged down in the technology. Yeah. But somehow, somehow guided both of you. So Peter Gabriel was a drummer, but he instead would work with the greatest drummers on the earth to play the drums for him. He doesn't get into the reverb and the delay and how to mix and how to patch. He would let someone do that, but somehow it guides you, inspires you, or somehow puts you in this way. Yeah, yeah. But you always felt it was—you always felt you were in a collaborative environment. You felt like you 
know, if you could present something that was dear to him, it kind of gave his heart. So that was a, that was a wonderful gift uh, on any record. I mean, that's what we all love to do. We love to see that how do you take the same instruments, that, the same power of sounds that are all working, and create something that hasn't been working? It's a weird That's a weird That's a real. Yeah, and you know, on the uh, again on the sorry, the, we're going back to the security that we, you know we recorded it in that barn and uh, before the studio was really good, but. He, he, he had this idea, I, I can't remember exactly, I think what happened was we, we were experimenting with room sounds, distortion, and compression. And we had everything, we were playing in the room and, you know, playing the drums. And then, you know, they get the drums to sound incredible. And then you hit a cymbal, it sounded awful. Because a cymbal, a snare drum, and a bass drum, that, that, that's like recording, you know, a flute, a violent, you know, like they're three drastically different sounds. Why would you know? They don't necessarily always, depending on what you're doing to them, and in this case, heavy compression, as you know, and distortion was working really well on the drums, the low tones, but then the cymbals sounded terrible. So the, the you know, the famous no cymbals record was just really get the cymbals out of you. Just don't, you can't hit them because they don't sound good. You're overdosing, you know, you're by some of the And this is a great thing, and it's also that thing of kind of the happy accident, which is so oftentimes what happens, and repeated really creates those in that environment where, you know, it's not, he, no one's really sure what's going on. But in the end, when you put it all together, it's just working. And in the end, it, it, I don't think anybody felt like the, the record needed single pressure. You know, because now when when the, song, when the when the song was going into the chorus, let's say, and there was a drum fill of some kind, something fill, and then there's a guitar thing, or like that thing comes in on the chorus, you hear it like a cymbal crash. You, know? you don't hear a cymbal crash masking it. You know what I mean? And then out of this, out of the trail of you know the decay of the cymbal, you hear that sound. Those sounds hit right on the boundary of the chorus, and it's incredibly Effective. I mean, that had a, you know, a, a big effect on me. He had a major effect on me. Yeah. Well, the way I worked on music. But um, it's that situation where, you know, you know, necessity was like, okay, let's not hit the symbols and the blue symbols later, which was quite a good question. But it's necessity for me. <laughs> Peter and I were like, we had some time we were just like this, you know, because it was. I've been so used to this crashing symbols for all I ever did, you know, I'm drunk, I go, bam, I said, okay, do everything, just don't get, you know, I'd be like, it was incredibly accommodating, I would come in and there'd be like pillows for the symbols, you know, hit something, I understand you have to look at it, but it can't make any sound. So you both kind of talk about the happy accidents and then these constraints, and it seems that part of that was just part of this as a result of the ethos of being residential musicians in the studio for a long time. And for those, of those participants in the course who are not maybe used to that kind of thing, do you have any strategies for how to create those same happy accidents or those same kinds of things that you just stumbled into in today's environment where people are maybe producing at home in the box or not necessarily having the luxury of a large studio? It's a much more difficult in the box because you know if you look at you know, any any DAW, it's like a word talking about the box. It's it's an exact same place as we left. And I was physically taking a reel of tape off the tape machine, putting it on the next time, physically putting it on the tape machine, threading the tape on, and then going locating the spot where the next song is going to be going to play. I may have forgotten to go to the patch but anymore and have patches and things that I patched in the previous week. And all of a sudden, maybe I might have cross lines and the bases and the guitar And even just for a moment, if I just hit play, I might have something that I had. That never happens in, in, in the guitar environment. It's exactly new. So, 
the randomness of the analog world in a way gave you many opportunities to discover things. You might have been close to it. So that doesn't even happen. So, so you have to force those in the, in the digital environment, especially in the, in the, in the, uh, in the home side. You know. And we also had an environment where people were collaborating, like multiple people were collaborating at the time, and it was invert. And even though you might have a worse idea, it might ultimately lead to a new better of Whereas when you're working in a flat, smaller environment, where you're, the, you're the musician, you're the engineer, you're the artist, you're the artist, it's very difficult to be brilliant at all of those different times. We all found our balance within that. Certain times and certain people were more forceful than others, depending on the situation. And that's what we're saying. What was the occasion that embraced? And it's like, which one did we do that in the development? That's not because if you break everything, it's going to so happen. <laughs> in, in that situation, and in other students, too. Would it be fair to say that a little bit the, the way the, <clears throat> the day was divided for you guys was? You were exploring and creating during the daytime and then fixing. Because I think there's the temptation in the box. These tools can fix so many things that someone might get moved into, I need to fix all this stuff. And you didn't, you, you had time to fix stuff that was going on in the synchronization, but you had set aside other time for exploring and making music. Maybe that would be a discipline in some of the things. Don't tune vocals or replace sounds when you feel we, we, we never, I mean, it was, it was always created during the daytime, and, and, and during the daytime and the night, nighttime was just the technical stuff as you, as you surmised. So it really was, and, and because we were recording to tape, really, the idea was first you had to get come up with a great idea, then you have to come up with a great song, and then you have to have a great song. And the arc in which all those three aligned might be a couple minutes, might be half an hour, might be two hours. But we were surrounded by great gifted players, so generally speaking, when we got a tape that we loved, it was great. It didn't need to be fixed because if, if there was a mistake, we scrolled back and punched in what we thought. Or if we discovered during the process of recording, let's just say Dave Rhodes, for instance, and he comes with a very unique guitar part, so let's say he would often um, try and figure out a new guitar part, and then by the time he got to the end of the song, he goes, Oh, God, I've actually figured out what I want to play. And then we we'll go back and play, play over the top. So sometimes that would work. It was, it was never the thing of like, that's not good enough. But we should, you know, we should keep it. It's like it's not good. It's not the same. We have limited tracks, and we get very disciplined about getting this stuff. I think another way also to kind of look at it is, it's not about fixing. It's in. It's like during the day, everybody wanders off, and and finds things. Like gathers together a basket full of stuff. I've got this, Freddie comes in with this, and then we even, you kind of put it all together and you see what you can make it. You know what I mean? It's it's kind of because in my experience with with computer, that's oftentimes what we were doing. We were we never walked in and recorded a song like in in a traditional sense. Yeah, exactly. It was we, we started to gather that he was gathering together. And to with us, the, the ideas of how you want things to sound, and then you know there has to be a point where somebody like you, or Dan, or Dan, right, or Dan, stays after school, <laughs> and 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 sort of starts. It's like a Rubik's cube, you know. You start playing around with it, seeing what's what works together, what doesn't work together. And I think to talk to just to what you're saying about people now. The, di the digital thing, it's, it's a little, it's, what's happened is actually never before has it been more, um, more have people been more able to do in a way that we did back then. Because back then, to do what we were doing was very expensive. I mean, to have people hired in like, for all that, that, for that kind of time, people just didn't make records for that. They didn't do that for the most part. But now, I would encourage people now because you you know you can have people have like access to super technology and you know I would say to people you know really there's no rush to do anything you know take your time experiment 
try different things. You're in, you're at home. You're doing it yourself. It's not costing you anything. You're not paying anything. You know what I mean? Like once you get whatever your source material together, people should think more about being more creative and trying to do things um, things a little differently than than what, what's sort of been accepted. And I think that with the demise of the music business as we knew it, there's less and less people standing over your shoulder going, no, you can't do that. Mm -hmm. This is a hit song. You can't record it. You have to do it this way. You know, we've both been through that many times. Mm -hmm. Or the record company steps in and they're paying for it. And they want, they want it to be a certain way. With Peter, ironically, that's the only record really that broke the mold for him. But, you know, I, I remember being in the dining room at Ashton House and there was a guy from Planet Records, a very famous guy, who came in and <laughs> was listening to stuff. And then he tried to convince Peter that he should sound more like Mike McDonald. And I, I know that's funny. I, mean, I, I think we all, we probably all do. And Mike McDonald's a super guy's great. But, but <laughs> that was not a good move, <laughs> you know. Because Peter was never going to do that. But, you know, that. I lived through a lot of that. But like, over the years, record after record, people trying to get him to sound like something else or like somebody else. And very interesting. Now, there, there's so much less of that. Now, I mean, now everybody can do this and do whatever they want. They're doing it on their own. Nobody's paying for it. And I, I think that people should take advantage of that and experiment and try to do things different. I think uh, uh, the, the thing that would be interesting on a, on a, in a, a, a recording situation, this is a Peter, this would be a Peter thing, is if you could, you have sounds and you EQ and you put effects on things and you get it where you think it sounds really great, and you press a button, and it just takes everything and it moves it to some somewhere else. Like your delay that's on your guitar is now on the kick drum. You know, it just randomly tosses everything, and, and that's very much a kind of a Peter thing. But to, to, if you try something, like, to do something that you know, no one would, putting a delay on something or affecting something, you know, because as an engineer, you know, it, it sort of tend to fall into that certain things sound right on certain things and mm -hmm. it's it's hard to break free from that. But, but um, that that's part of the the, the thing that I think uh, this technology now as it as it gets more extensive that people can do that kind of thing. Really really try to affect the music and make it sound different. So creativity really is a discipline that's bring that discipline even to today's production environment. Give yourself time to be Branding, exploring, and other times when you think about it. So you make yourself do that today. Yeah. You know, nowadays, you know, the constraints are, the constraints are usually budgetary. You know, everybody wants to make a drastic sounding record. And what the budget, you know, if you're going to go to a commercial facility, even a semi commercial facility, you're going to be only going to two or three weeks. The thing that you're doing things in the room, but you can be very, very very early on after we left Genesis, he recognized the that he was part of his own methodology of recording that he, he wanted to do his library, his own time. So he would take his record of Genesis and put them the studio. So the studio evolved at the time. So he would see Jerry, Jerry was doing stuff, you know, on the fire records, and the studio was a kind of um, cell phone record, and it was more fun. And then they pulled the legislation of the boss. It was more formed than also technology. Yeah. Digital technology really made it very and Peter was way on top of it. Yeah, he was on the on you know on, on so much so that he, he with his cousin he opened up a store yeah. in, in London. So they, they were getting like all the gear. Like, he, they were getting everything. They get, the store was getting all every new piece of equipment, anything they had. So he had to, he get, was able to get his hands on it. Newest technology, and, and um, that—that's what I think made that home, kind of semi-home studio really explode. I mean, he was—he was one of the first artists to really have a home studio. I mean, maybe, like I'm sure there were other artists who had them as well. I mean, he—he he took it to a new level. And so he could constrain the time, it didn't even impose itself on this particular. And whereas now in, in the current environment, it's really that is the issue. People want to make album. We do believe artists want to make 
that's my own set of also now. Again, this is five maps, and we're going to run out of the budget as always. And it really needs to be 50 more fun maps in particular. So, and so I, you know, I draw my experience and go, well, okay, realistically, what can I do? What can I do? Since I'm able to make this easy fun. I'm still interested in making the best thing ever. Especially in this generation where these truly sounds and sound really and really the artists and the producers and the entities which you can actually be heard by so again is where we go. Which is you know, I think that's most of the time. Yes, it's the idea of the rock save to to vinyl, to cassette, to consideration of C D to digital audio tape. Audience has never really heard what I've heard in the studio or that's they've never heard that portion. They've heard the approximation of it. And now when you actually can We've gotten down to the worst center of the program ever in the history of the program. And that's what people are responding to. And I don't think that people really respond emotionally to it. So how can you take something and downsample it and say that we're going to just drop pieces of, pieces of information and somehow solve them into a magic game? What's it taking away? It's taking away something. It's taking away some emotional. It's taking away some Just to me, we can find out. So when you look at look at how to be random, how to kind of create uh, create environments where music, musicians can be creative, then yeah, the technology you know we can record an amazing sound like this one. As long as you know, we can pay the overhead for the recording. Capital is not the most expensive thing we have in there. Did you find, just very quickly, I, I always refer to it that, that period of time of working with Peter, particularly the security record, is walking on the moon. I got to walk on the moon. Not a lot of people get to do that. Did you find that after after all of that time working with Peter on that record, when you go out into the real world, pun <laughs> intended, but you go out and you, and you go to a studio with an artist and a producer, and, then, and it's like you hear it, you hear the piano, guitar, voice thing that you mix on one, but people don't want it. Or they don't want to decide that, you know, it's a whole different environment. And, you know, in a lot of ways, I had struggled with that. Because all of those years of working with Peter and what I learned from him about the creative process, when I would take that into a session here in New York and I was playing on somebody's record, you know, they wanted to cut, you know, ten tracks in three or four days. They, you know, it's frustrating because when you hear something, there's something there, but we got to find it and it's going to take time. And Peter's thing is, we're going to take it as long as it takes to find that thing. And it's more frustrating because, you know, to work in a different environment where that's not the agenda. You know, people are like, just want to get the record done, any drums on it, you know, those drums, just need to have them sound like drums. They're like drum music. So it's very interesting. It's kind of a kind of frustrating for me um, to, um, and it's one of the reasons why I really don't work on that many. And I don't put myself in that position. I haven't in a long time, but I just can't because it's, it's it's not fun for me. It's not it's not fulfilling you know, to just go in and be the drummer and play. You know, especially when the music is good. If the music isn't very good, then it's easy. But you know, if there's something really there, and they're not getting it, or they're missing it, you know, and you know, we come from that, you know, we've, 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 you know, we've walked on the moon. You know what I mean? It's it's uh, it, it's very difficult. I find very difficult. It's interesting from, from my perspective that when I finished the record with Peter, Peter pulled me aside and he said, you, know, "You do realize, well, he, so there were a lot of issues on the record, like from a technical perspective, which you know, I don't have." So, when we got close to the completion of the record, it was a part of me that I mean, I only was hearing the flaws in the record. I wasn't hearing, I was hearing my process in the record, my fans process in the record. I was hearing all of these, I wish I would have done something different to make it something better. I felt pretty insecure about it. And uh, I went out to London to master the record. And he, and he had mastered 
Sometimes we actually got hired, like, when like it was Manning and Tony and David Rose all got hired on me, hired on the same project, and they wanted, they really wanted that sound. Or they wanted a prior version of it. Yeah. And yet the music was the thing that dictated you know, how people play dance, you know, for the production, and even you know, for the improvement of the music. It was, you know, it was, it was, it was the assembled of past. You kind of just said, well, fortunately, I didn't expect Right. You want that sound. First of all, start by writing that song. Oh, right. That's the and then, first thing. And then people think, you know, take my way. song and you know, turn it into Wallflower or, or uh, Don't uh, don't Give Up is a, is a classic example to me. You know, you know, that, the bass line on that song is just staggering. staggering. You can't just... And Tony's very good at doing that kind of you know, Something that's not as well written as Don't Give Up. But you know, having people yeah. fire you to do that thing, that, which is so uneven. But one of the things that you was really question that I'll, I'll get asked about, especially with Tony's part, he would say, how did you get such an amazing bass line on today? Was Tony there? I didn't do anything. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and the thing that Jerry will notice is when we're working with Tony, Tony's like, he's a force of nature. He will sit there and he'll come into a session and he'll hear a song and he'll sit and he'll start playing around. And he's formulating an idea. It's, it's an interesting idea. You can look at this. But it doesn't sound amazing. Right? It's not necessarily properly in time. It's not necessarily the greatest thing. But it's, I mean, and you usually just take a direct. It's just a direct projection. And he'll do another pass and he's, oh, I think I have a part. You know, rewind the tape after the test. This is the, all those DAW users out there. This is the two minutes to have rewind the tape. You go to the top and then you hit play, you win the report. And literally, out of nowhere, this sound with here in front of me was like very thick, three dimensional. Did someone just step on the pedal? What, 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 what just happened here? And, and it was like that man on that bass with those fingers and that music man used that sound. My job was to go, I'm really good at this one still. Yeah, don't just screw don't, it. Don't, just screw don't it you know, make sure you're in the board and stay out of the way. And so, you know, people talk about. What you do? Your job is to realize when something great is happening and to not do it. Right? Be, you know, be, be the documentary, be the vice man, or make sure you follow it down. And that happens so many times with all these issues. Like, you know, they were bringing so many things down, and because the environment was so conducive to the flow, it just became that thing. It just became really great. That's great. And there's lots of great parts that never made it to the as the groups evolved. Some of those parts have to be discovered. They weren't discovered like that. Oh, that's a fantastic record. Maybe I'll end up on something else. Another record. Because Peter doesn't discover it. One of the songs on the record, I think there were about 16 songs initially, and we got with the Dent about 12 when I arrived, which is not part of it. And then we got with the Dent a few more. There was a song called Courage that um, we all felt was a really strong song. It's kind of in the big time kind of slow channel. Uh, but he couldn't find a lyric, he couldn't sign on a lyric that he loved. So the record came to completion and he never finished the lyric. He actually finished the lyric last year. 
and he released it as part of the Atomic Movement. So he never gave up on the idea, which says a lot about his great spirit. He knows it's great. I'm not actually the person that I can we need to wrap up the online portion of this. We'll talk to you guys a little bit more afterwards. Uh, so just as a wrapping up gesture, I wonder if there are any other comments you might have. In particular, we talked a lot about this wonderful collaborative process. But would you have any advice for the self-producing, self highly motivated, of passionate person who's alone in the house to try to Try and find some good collaborators to work with. Oh. I think the best music is always maybe maybe with one or two exceptions when you actually collaborate. You need somebody to bounce ideas off. I think that is the most effective way to not only um, inspire you, but also to, to get the, the design results and perhaps even go beyond that. But from my own perspective, and I'm perhaps recording a week's end. I know what my room really is in terms of what the artist expects, and then I like to go beyond and see if I can go beyond their expectations. And I think that's when you get the most satisfaction when you've gone beyond their expectations. And I think if you're doing everything, um, you can't be a master of every, every discipline. There's nothing in life you can be a master of that. But I guess expectation just because you can do the stuff that you should is such a, such a rabbit hole. So I highly encourage the collaboration with computers. Which happens less and less, less and now less. because people are at home working on, you know, working on stuff. And they're, 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 they're trying to uh, save money. And they're doing thing one stuff one piece at a time. And oftentimes, you know, they'll, then they'll get to drums. And whoever's doing whatever they're doing, you're working to this, this thing that is a movable object. There's no room for when you get a group of people in a room together, and this has happened so many times. You play through the song, you play through the song, you get to the end, and you're kind of damping at the end, and then there's three minutes of damp, and it turns into the bridge. And then all of a sudden, it's like, oh my god, that's, that's, that's amazing. That's, that, that kind of thing doesn't happen unless you're kind of playing with people, or you're interacting and you're working up around. That, that, that sort of thing happens less and less. So I, I agree with you that uh, try, to, try to collaborate with people, to, you know, experiment with different people. Um, uh, yeah, do, doing your thing and seeing how it works with somebody else. Um, it's, it's very pleasant to hear music. Like I, I'll get to experience it while I'm working on mix all day on the other show. So so at least we hear about that all the time. And all of a sudden I'm hearing the mix to the bits are there and it's all and and it alters my perspective. You don't get that in the way only because the the tendency of human nature is to call us the gun really good. And the technology allows you that and affords you that opportunity to move everything. Each program. At the end of the day, maybe that's not the thing. Maybe it's the the beauty of music is actually in the clouds. So, when you do it all for yourself, you have to recognize the clouds and the wrong clouds. Well, thank you both so much for giving us the time and sharing your stories and your expertise with that. Um, can we begin? And uh, again, if you've been watching the live stream, we will have a higher quality edited version up for you in a day or two. So thank you again for attending my live, and we'll see you at LinkedIn Music Network. Thanks.